And thank you, uh, Harvest Berry. What a privilege it's been for me <clears throat> these last three weeks to be so warmly received by this congregation and to be able to open up this great book of Colossians with you. And just a, a word about this book. What I love about this little four-page epistle, at least in my Bible, is uh, it's multi-use. I mean, if you're looking to just get a refresher on Christianity and some high points and some, you know, things, uh, it's a 20-minute read. If you're looking for something where you want to dig deep and go word by word and pull out riches for six months, this is also your book. Or if you want a hybrid approach, you can just do what we're doing this summer over 10 weeks and allow Colossians to form you and shape your heart and your mind. I mean, just think about where we've come in two weeks. We, we got deep into the gospel by seeing Paul's uh, incredible prayer, one of the most profound prayers in the New Testament. And then last week, we saw what I would call uh, the Mount Everest description of Jesus Christ in the Bible. That's what Paul gives us. And um, I, I told you that uh, pa Paul is very crafty because he's doing two things simultaneously. On the one hand, he's teaching the Colossians basic Christianity. And on the other hand, as he's doing that, he's, he's subverting and undermining the heretical influences of these teachers that had crept into the church and were starting to sow seeds of discord. So, um, you know, today we're going to continue, and I want to show you where uh, we go, um, because there's a question I'm going to ask you in a few moments, but before we get to the question, I want to prime the pump, so to speak, with just the first couple verses of uh, our passage today. We're in chapter 1, uh, verse 24. Chapter 1, verse 24. He says this, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Now, stop right there. I mean, did he just say something was lacking in Jesus about his cross, about his sacrifice? I mean, I mean that, that's kind of confusing. We'll just hold on for a moment. Let's complete the thought. Verse 25, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship, which is kind of like a commission, from God that was given to me for you. Now, I'm going to keep this part real simple. Um, he is not saying here that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was lacking. He was not saying that it is finished really only meant 99% and Paul's doing the rest. That, like, there's, there's a lot of bad ways you could go with this verse. What I will say is this. You need to understand that Jesus' victory at the cross, including his suffering, is the gospel, but it alone doesn't proclaim the gospel. Who is called to proclaim the gospel? We are. His people. And what does the Bible say will happen sometimes when we proclaim or share or communicate the gospel? Over and over again, we're instructed not to be surprised by the fact that there will be pushback. There will be anger. There may even be suffering as a result of that. Think of Paul. He's in prison while he's ministering to them. A Roman prison, not the one where you can you know, do a degree and have access to TV and other things. It, 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 this is a dungeon. He probably has candles and a parchment. But he was the guy who, before he was a Christian, was the grab a pitchfork and let's go get those Christians. And he led raids on Christians, leading to lots of persecution um, interesting backstory for the guy that wrote this stuff. But if you remember in Acts chapter 9, in that famous 
scene on the road to Damascus, Jesus intervenes in his life. And Jesus says to him, as he appears to him, why are you persecuting me? Essentially, what Jesus was saying is, when you lay a hand on one of my own, you're persecuting me. See, Jesus takes this very seriously. So after blinding him, he directs this believer uh, guy in another town to find Saul. And this guy who is very understandably nervous about meeting the infamous Saul the Slayer, I call him. uh, Jesus tells him this. Don't worry. He is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So when Paul is writing uh, to them here and interceding to them in prayer, what he's saying simply is this. I know that the ministry God's given me, that he's commissioned me with, is going to involve hardships and difficulties and persecutions. And I know that those aren't done yet. That's what he's saying. Okay, now to the question I want to ask you. Because he mentions the fact that he's suffering for the church for the sake of his ministry. The question is, how should a ministry of a healthy church affect me? I mean, that's a good question for you to ask. What should I be looking for in a church? How should it be impacting me and my family? And interestingly, some of that stuff comes out of what he's going to say. Now, there are books written on this you know, way more than I'm going to go in today. But I am going to let Paul unpack it because that's the direction he's headed in for the next few verses. So I got just four things about um, the kind of impact ministry should have and that you need and that you need to be open to. Here's the first thing, message. The message of ministry. The message of ministry is the revealed mystery of Christ. So I think we can all agree that if you have a ministry, you should have a message, right? And I think we can all agree that uh, it would be a good idea for everyone in that ministry to know the message. Except the first point I just put on the screen there is kind of a mouthful, isn't it? It's a bit odd. I mean, why didn't you just say, Leo, the message of the ministry is the gospel? That would be nice and straightforward. But no, I got to put in revealed mystery of Christ. Well, I'm letting Paul talk. And that's what we do when we unpack the scriptures. And, and, and in the, the next few verses, you're going to see one of the most unique and interesting cluster of ideas on the idea of the message in the New Testament. Look in the middle of verse 25 with me. He says, to make known the word of God, or to make the word of God fully known. All right, that's clear. The word of God, fully known. Verse 26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to the saints. So uh, uh, if you'd like to underline in your Bibles, I'd underline that word mystery right there. Uh, Verse 27, he says, to them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. There it is a second time, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, if you wouldn't mind, just scroll down to chapter 2 and into the middle of verse 2, you'll see this. And the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ. Three times in one passage, Paul uses this word, mystery. I mean, what's going on? Is Paul being mystical suddenly? Why does Paul frame everything with this word? Answer. He knows the worldview of the gospel enemies in Colossae better than they do, in fact. These Gnostics, or what is known as Gnosticisms, one of their key tenets was the idea of a mystery knowledge. Secret 
available only to those who have attained or come to a certain level of initiation. So Paul is very forward-looking here. Um, in fact, more so uh, than perhaps he realized at the time. Um, uh, you may not uh, know this, but over the next two to 300 years after this, um, long after the apostles are all dead, this movement will write deceptively enticing little epistles with names like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of Judas, and the Secret of John. Um, academics refer to these and a few others, uh, the cluster, as the Gnostic Gospels. No one knows exactly who wrote them, but uh, shocker of shockers, they all said pretty much the same thing with some nuances. Nothing problematic, of course, just that Jesus wasn't God. And I found this very interesting as I was looking into it. I mean, I could have listed 20 things they were saying, but the one that stood out was they had this teaching uh, that Jesus wasn't God, but he was a special emissary sent um, from the divine realm to Thomas, Mary Magdalene, Philip, Judas, and John to give them secret teachings. And one of those secret teachings was something called the divine spark. And the idea was there was this divine spark trapped within every human's body. And the key to life was to get in touch with it and let it explode so that you could be enlightened. So they redefined salvation. Salvation, from their point of view, is not about forgiveness of sins or of reconciliation to a holy God or of a Jesus who stood in the place of sinners. No, 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 no. Salvation is liberation from our ignorance of this divine spark. And once you've been liberated, you will have the knowledge to be enlightened and be united with the divine. It's not sin that's our problem, it's ignorance. You see now, again, why Paul is so insistent on pressing in on this. So Paul is, is like taking acts to root here, and he's saying, no, I'm going to take your word, mystery. Here's the mystery. It's not a secret code to be enlightened. It's not something only a few people know. In fact, I'm making it an open secret. God made it an open secret because he revealed it very clearly to the world. I mean, Paul's basically saying, look, if, if my job is to preach that mystery and my goal is to mature you in Christ, why would I hold something back from you, some essential secret ingredient that only a few get to know? That would make no sense. It's an open secret. In those verses I read, he says, the mystery is Jesus Christ. Even more, he says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. We talked about this in our first week, the hope of heaven for eternity with Jesus, available to, and we see this here, the, the mystery, uh, available to both Jew and Gentile who are united into one people of God if they're in Christ. And in Christ, what Paul wants to make clear is there's no insiders and outsiders. In Christ, you are all qualified, redeemed, reconciled. All that stuff on the gospel in chapter one, that's there. That's the mystery. Yes, before the coming of Christ in the Old Testament, we know from Scripture that the prophets, Peter tells this, us this in 1 Peter 1, 12, uh, the prophets yearn to know who that Messiah would be and how it all works. Here's a quote from Peter in, in, first, in that there. Even angels long to know these things. So it wasn't until Jesus that the mystery gets fully revealed to the world. But Paul's saying, this mystical secret of nonsense, we're settling this now. There is only one mystery. It's an open secret. It's Christ. It's the gospel. You say, okay, so, so, the, so this mystery isn't so mysterious. It's the gospel. What does that mean for me? 
No, notice this next thing. Here's where he starts taking it. There's a goal. The goal of ministry is making mature disciples. Notice verse 28. Him we proclaim. That word proclaim means to announce, to herald, to speak out about broadly and widely. This is what Paul was commissioned to do. Verse 25, and it's uh, the mission of the church. It's the church's ministry. What is it involved? Well, do you see the next two words? Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Okay, so Paul, you've said everyone three times in one verse. I get it. It's not for a select group. It's not for private ceremonies. But those two words, warning and teaching, really do jump out. Paul is showing that they are complementary to biblical ministry. They're complementary to a healthy church. On the one hand, uh, negatively, warning uh, is uh, uh, correcting and admonishing believers when they are headed into danger. And then positively, teaching really refers to explaining the whole counsel of God. At this very moment, that's what I'm going to be doing, warning and teaching. That's balanced ministry. You drop one of them, and you lose something. Now, some Christians don't want to hear warning in the church. They don't. It's so negative, so judgy. Now, I, I admittedly, actually, and I've seen this myself, there are some people who just take on the warning thing a little bit too much, but they, they warp it. And they use it to warn people about their own hobby horses. No, 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 no. Paul's talking about warning related to anything that shifts your eyes off Jesus, off the gospel. Paul did not shrink back from the tough job of rebuking error and evil. In a fallen world where people naturally go astray, and especially in a church um, which at times is marked by unfaithfulness, warning cannot be avoided. By warning people uh, uh, against a a fuller um, and therefore false gospel, by warning them against a pseudo-Christianity, by warning them against a false ministry, he in fact helped them see the fullness of the gospels, helped them see what maturity really needs to be, helps them to understand how to discern true ministry. Why is this important? It's in the text, because the goal of ministry is to present people mature in Christ. You say, present to who? Present to God. What God's doing in your life right now, all of this work of refining is part of God a part of the, the, um, that sanctification process of maturing to be presentable to God. We're all going to be standing before him. And you need to understand that God doesn't just want to forgive you. He wants to transform you. That is the complete Christian picture. The goal of ministry is maturity. Not just that you get the fire insurance and be on your way to heaven, but that you would grow into the very likeness of Jesus. Or as Paul said in Ephesians 4.14, that you would no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And boy, is that a, is that a relevant term today. Every, every moment you, you flip on a screen, there's new, new winds of doctrine. But that you would grow up into all things, into the head who is Christ. That, that, that's the goal, maturity. So, let me ask you a question. In your life, is there, is there a pursuit of the Lord in your life? I mean, you don't have to answer out loud. This is for you, but you should do some thinking here. Is there any pursuit 
of Jesus going on in your heart? Do you ever have moments where you reflect on some things in your life that you know are sinful and, and, and you go, you know what, what, what? I'm going to do something about this. I know I've got forgiveness, but I have to make some changes. Or are you just like, eh, me and God have worked out a deal. We're just kind of pretend that that doesn't exist. Ignore that. He understands. He's gracious. I'll just ride that. I think if those things don't ever come across the, 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 the screen of your life, you got some heart work to do. You have some thinking to do. What's going on in there? Is it possible you've bought into some alternative Jesus? If you're in a church that presses you to ask yourself questions like these, thank God for that. Trust God when those uncomfortable pressing questions come into your life. Trust that he is using them to help shape you for things ahead in your own life you don't even know about. Trust him that this is part of how he wants you to be formed into Christ in you. You'll never know what goes on behind the scenes in the lives of pastors and elders and mature believers in the church that God has placed in your life uh, to help you with this. I'm not just saying that. Paul's saying it. Look, at it. he says this is hard work. The burden of being the person that proclaims and warns and teaches. I mean, look at him in verse 29. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. So he knows God's helping him, but he's toiling. Chapter 2, verse 1, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. And he could say that about any of the churches he um, pastored, planted, supported. So if that's the goal, you have to have an attitude that says, my heart needs to be open to the work of preparing me for Jesus in my life, in my marriage, in my family, in my walk, and in my worship. You hear that and you're like, you know, I'm with you. I don't disagree. But it's hard. It's hard for me sometimes. And, and particularly this last week, it's been very difficult. I'm a little thrown off by some stuff and well, I want you to notice how Paul pastorally now shifts from teaching and warning to something very important. Note this third thing, the comfort, the comfort of ministry. It's a mark of the healthy church. The comfort of ministry is unity and assurance. Notice verse 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love. You know, there is nothing more incredible than a body of, of Christ followers who are in unity. And I don't mean in unity around, you know, a speaker or around, uh, you know, a building or around something. I mean, in unity together in Christ. There's something unique and special up to this point. Uh, the unity Paul's been pressing has primarily been doctrinal, but he's had to do that because of, of the danger of the Gnostics. But here he now... Um, really wants to talk about relationally. He says, when you knit together encouragement in love, you get a unity that is incredible. That word encourage, by the way, comes from a Greek word that um, has the idea of calling someone to come stand by you. It's like, hey, come on over here. That's the idea of encouragement. You encourage someone by being alongside them, not over them in terms of authority or under them in terms of servanthood, but the emphasis here is, is 
beside them relationally. That's what he's emphasizing. That's how you encourage someone, beside them. If you want to bless someone, if you want to encourage someone, get beside them. Not in front of them, not behind them, not over them, not behind them, beside them. Well, well, when I do that, what, what do I say? Well, there's a lot of things that can go into encouraging some, someone. I, I, I would say, um, just very practically, um, listen before you speak. Hear their story, or if you know it already, demonstrate some understanding. Those are good things. They help people hear what you may have to say. Anytime the Bible talks about encouragement in relationships, we hear things like exhort, edify, bless, appealing to them. Paul is calling upon the believers in this church to come along uh, side one another and be an encouragement to each other. Now listen, the Bible talks about the God of all comfort. And there are people in this room that could give testimony about how God himself uniquely comforted, comforted them in a very difficult time. It was God who did it. But here in this particular verse, Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about the encouragement that we can bring one another. Now, I want you to know that there's a lot of people here in this room today that need encouragement. And I wish that in some way we could all visually see uh, and grasp the incredible potential here to encourage I mean, we all have within us this God-given capacity to be such an immense blessing to one another. And I'm telling you, the ministry of encouragement is critical. I mean, I can almost hear from Paul in this text him saying, man, if I could just get to your church if I, out of this prison, the first thing I do is get alongside some people, put my arm around them, and I'd be asking God to give me insight on how I can strengthen them and encourage them in their walk, in their hearts. You think this is too touchy-feely? Not at all. It's important. This is big-time ministry. People need it. Chances are, if someone cared enough and looked close enough, they would see the reality behind your worn facial expression, your drooping shoulders, your guarded comments, your quiet sighs. You know, if the truth were known, you're craving encouragement, but perhaps you're grieving as well because you found it in such short supply in your experience with the church. Have you been there lately? Hibernating in some den of discouragement, licking your wounds under some dark cloud that won't blow away, and the best thing some Christian has had for you is suck it up. Paul wants so much more to be going on in a healthy church. He built it into the essential unity of the church. Now, I am praying that in the last three weeks, I've been a small encouragement to you in this ministry. But more importantly, I am praying that you would all see the power that you have to bring unity through the encouragement of one another. Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. A healthy church is a church where it's got to a place where all the encouragement isn't coming from just two people. You know, you, you know the church where everyone knows it's those two? Yeah, they, they, they're great at it. They're, you know, they're, we'll leave that to them. No, a healthy church is when more and more and more people start to take upon themselves the responsibility of, you know what? When I get with God's people, 
I'm going to find a way, I don't know how yet, to show some encouragement to that person and, and, and in doing so, be part of the overall unifying that Jesus Christ will do. The comfort of, of ministry, encouragement's one of them. He has another, it's assurance. We see assurance here in verse 2. Do you see there? To reach all the, rich, the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, what does God want for you? He wants you to have assurance. What does assurance mean? It's a settled conviction. It's the best way I can describe it. It's a settled conviction about what Jesus is, has said, who he is, what his promises are, what he means to me, what he has said about me, his assurance. I, it, it's a settled conviction that enables us to turn aside from the enticing words of the world, to turn aside from the enticing words of false prophets and to bear up against the buffeting of the world. It's settled conviction insurance that enabled the martyrs throughout church history to deal with faithfulness in the face of death. There's a story, historical fact. In the year 155, um, there was a bishop by the name of Polycarp who died as a martyr. He was 86 years old. It is said that he was mentored under the, under the Apostle John as a young man. He was a faithful pastor, well regarded in his community, but this was a time where the emperor had declared uh, and allowed for the persecution of Christians, and it became increasingly bad. And when it was uh, Polycarp's turn, he stood at his trial before the Roman proconsul, and the man said to him, Polycarp, I will let you live. I will not put you into the fire. He was burned alive. I will not put you in the fire if you will just deny Christ. And that old man said, for 80 and 6 years I have served him and he has never denied me yet. How pro counsel can I deny him? That is a man with settled conviction. He knows Christ to be the one, as verse 3 says, is the one who has all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He knows that Christ knows him. And he is not willing to trade Christ for anything else the world offers or to add anything to the gospel. He is settled in his conviction about the hope which is in Christ alone. You say, you know... Um, I wish I could have deeper assurance about my salvation and my walk with God, but I, I don't. I'm, I, I'm up and down sometimes. I just, uh, just I, I'm, I, live, I live with a lot of fear about it. And, you know, am I, am I a Christian? Am I not? Does Jesus love me? Does he not? Can I just tell you what I've observed over the years uh, in pastoral ministry? It's not complicated. Our assurance of our salvation, it grows and intensifies in direct correlation to the time that we've invested in getting to know God in his word. Okay? I, it, it just seems to be the, the observation. Now, why is that the case? Here's why. Because the seeds of peace and certainty of Jesus, grow in the soil of your heart the more you expose yourself to knowing more about Jesus. And that's what grows. Simply put, 
defeat doubt by soaking your mind in the scriptures. Now listen, for some people, ignorance is bliss. Not with this. Ignorance of God's word is the breeding ground for heresy and skepticism. Sin-killing, Satan-silencing confidence doesn't just fall from heaven like rain, nor do we just bump into it coincidentally uh, as we skip ignorantly down the road to eternity. It's not the Christian life. But I promise you, brother and sister, as you get to know more of the Lord in this book. The Holy Spirit is there with you. And all along, he starts indelibly printing on your heart and your mind and your soul and your spirit that sense of assurance. Invest in it. Sam Storms is a guy I quoted last week. I want to quote him again. He talks a little bit about what I'm talking about, about the impact of time in the word and the Holy Spirit working and the assurance that comes. I just want you to hear him talk. He says this, ponder it deeply. He's talking about the word. Pray for it daily. He's talking about assurance. Plunder its riches. Back to the word. Protect it from defile it defilement, penetrate its mysteries, prize it above all earthly wealth and all human wisdom, all fleshly gain. There's nothing you could could ever hope to know about God, his will and his ways that you won't find in Jesus. He alone is the treasury of divine wealth and wisdom. Final thing here. How does church... A healthy church impact me. Protection. Protection. The protection of ministry counteracts deception. Notice verse 4. He says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Now, Paul's obviously worried about something. He's worried about deception. That word delude in my translation, um, can also be translated as deceived or beguiled or misled or tricked or led astray. Here's the question. Is Paul just uptight? Kind of a, a worry wart? Well, I would say, well, was Jesus? Because he had something to say about it that sounds shockingly similar. Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Whoa. I don't like what I'm about to say, but I can't shake this. We live right now in what may be the most biblically illiterate time since the Reformation. That is not good. It's like people aren't just not equipped enough. It's people aren't even that interested in going further. There, there's, a, there's a lethargy hanging over Christianity right now. Wake up! This is not trivial matter that I bring before you today, nor is it that, uh, what Paul is bringing. I mean, I look around, man. One book, one movie, one podcast, one TikTok video, one social media influencer pushing some new take on spirituality, and boom! Goes, uh, down goes a swath of Christians into confusion, into wavering, into divisiveness, and worse, some of them start imitating those very people. Remember I mentioned earlier that, that those group of, of books called the Gnostic Gospels? 
I mean, th- I, this is what blows my mind about Paul. I don't know if he knew this would be a thing that would continue to go on or not. But did you know there was a revival of this movement in the uh, late 19th century? It was called Neo-Gnosticism, and it continues to this day in different circles. It led to, uh, at one, uh, to something mo- many uh, might not know, but some of us who are older may have heard of it. It was called the Theosophical Society, Theosophy. It influenced uh, the very um, famous Freud. He had a star pupil in psychology named Carl Jung. Carl Jung was very influenced by neo-Gnosticism, and it, it, it fed into... Um, a type of the psychological world called psychoanalysis. It started showing up in um, major universities in their religious studies departments through the 20th century, especially due to the writings of Princeton academic Elaine Pagels, but there were many, many more. And yes, I'm including Canadians, uh, Canada's universities here. I've seen uh, the curriculums. They wrote many books about an alternative Christianity, and it is essentially this stuff. And then the blockbuster book and then movie with Tom Hanks, The Da Vinci Code, comes out in 2006, and the writer of that book referred to these hidden gospels as a conspiracy by the church to keep these truths from you. I remember it because I remember pastoring at that time. And do you know, for years, pastors were going around the church, putting out fires amongst their people who were coming to them going, hey, can we even trust this book, the Bible? I just found out there's a whole bunch of other gospels that aren't put in there. Shouldn't they just be listed beside Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, I could write a book called The Gospel of Leo. Should that be in the Bible? Like, I feel like this church has been biblically trained enough for me to just respond to that question with, really? Mystery books written one to 200 years after all of the apostles that outright deny everything in the New Testament, they should be in the Bible. They're the ones throwing you off. So, back to Paul. Is he being overprotective? No, he's in line with Jesus, the Spirit, and the apostles. Uh, Did you know this? The Holy Spirit said something about it. Um, 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul reports what the Spirit said. He says, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter days, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves, note this, to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars who are, whose consciences are seared. Peter, chief of the 12 disciples, you know him, he said in 2 Peter chapter 2, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing up upon themselves destruction. When Paul was training Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, he says, if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy. Have we seen that around the world these last five years? An unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, and evil suspicions. And then when Paul wrote to the big church in Rome, he said, Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Christ. 
but their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. Paul says, verse 4, do you see the phrase there? The way they work is through plausible arguments. That means it sounds pretty, yeah. It's, his point here is, it's not like these teachers show up with satanic tattoos and Viking hammers. That anyone would go, whoa, we just need to stay away from them. No, no, no. Plausible arguments. These are the type of people, uh, Paul's saying, that they engage, they come in, they woo, they gather influence. They're skilled in the art of persuasion. Whether it's either eloquence, passion, charisma, or their outrage. However it's done, somehow people start buying in. In fact, People that start getting under the influence, they start thinking to themselves, this feels, it feels good. It feels better. It's fe- it feels what I've been feeling all along. That's the naive that Paul was talking about earlier. Now, maybe this doesn't hit clo- uh, home or close to home for you at all, and it's kind of still theoretical. I read this and I shiver um, because it is personal for me. Sadly, I have seen too many professing Christians, some very close to me, drift away from the biblical gospel into other movements with a, a mystical or political or ideological twist and that has just enough Christianese in it to make it a cocktail that goes down so sweet to the taste. This is why you need the ministry of a healthy church because ministry isn't just about caring for the sheep. It's also about fighting wolves. How many churches and denominations could we list in the last 100 years that used to hold firm to a gospel-centeredness and then over 5, 10, 20, 50 years dissolved into some kind of spirituality with echoes of the gospel but no Jesus Christ alone? How many? The list is long. Despite his intensity, Paul ends this on a glad note. And I'm glad too. He says, For though I am absent in the body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and firmness of your faith in Christ. Obviously, he had been told that they're holding fast. They're not all falling into it. Rejoicing to see your good order and firmness in of your faith in Christ. May that be said of you. So decide to stand firm. Decide. Decide to stand firm, rooted deeply in Christ plus nothing else. May this be said of Harvest Berry until the Lord returns in glory. How should the ministry of a healthy church impact you? It's got to ground you in the message, man. It's got to ground you in the message of this mystery of Christ. It's got to help you grow into maturity. It's got to bring the comfort. Paul talks about a specific comfort of unity and assurance. And it protects you. It helps you discern decisions deception. So the decision to embrace that or not, well, that is for you to decide. Let's pray. Lord, these are both glorious but also sobering words. And there is a ministry now that we look to of the Holy Spirit 
to apply certain and press uh, certain areas, to press on our hearts in certain areas. There are people here uh, that uh, um, had a sense of you speaking to them, moving, challenging them on any number of these points. And I ask, Lord, that you, by your spirit, would be stirring up a sense of hope in Christ, a sense of getting back to the basics of a singular focus on the one true Lord and Savior. For others, it might be that you've been pressing on them to wake up, to see what's going on around them, to have spiritual eyes and understanding, to seriously press further into you. In whatever way, Lord, I just pray as we worship in this last song that you would be ministering in our midst in a way that only you can do.